in the areas of arts and letters, we determined to validate the benefits of cultural and aesthetic values. And however we choose to do that, an artwork, a book, our song has the capacity to elicit pleasure when appreciated or experienced. To our distinguished guests, SOARS, family and friends, good morning and welcome to this Arts and Letters event, Eye of the African American Experience in the Arts, designed for your own enjoyment and pleasure. When we think of the arts, we think about a group of activities done by people with skill and imagination, and music, drama, creative writing, painting, sculpture, photography, to name a few are the major components. This morning, we have three lovely panelists who have come to share with us their skills, their talents, their gifts. And we are very happy and excited that they chose to be here with us on this brisk Saturday morning as I am sure there are many other things they could have been doing. This event is sponsored by Ascension Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and hosted by the Arts and Letters Committee chaired by Shanikia Spears. Its primary purpose is that of cultural enrichment and the development and coordination of programs such as this. We wanna thank you for your presence and for choosing to share your time with us this morning. We trust that you will enjoy the program that has been playing and that it will be one of sheer delight and inspiration. As in all arts, the enjoyment increases when the knowledge of art is uh, accomplished. Once again, we thank you for sharing this time with us and happy Saturday as this is the first day of spring. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. On behalf of the Arts and Letters Committee, we are absolutely ecstatic to bring this dynamic group of awesome ladies together and provide a platform for them to share some insight on the African-American female perspective in the arts. Before we move forward in the program, I would like to go over a few housekeeping tips for, op for optimal viewing experience. Please mute your microphone for the entire program. Select the speaker view option for an optimal experience. Use the chat feature for any questions or polls. Turn off your video to minimize any um, maximum to maximize your data usage. Next, I'd also like to introduce our my moder moderator, Miss Christy Rapp. Christy Isaac Rapp is a member of Ascension Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and serves as chair of the Physical and Mental Health Committee. She currently serves as the Associate Dean of College of Pharmacy at Xavier University of Louisiana in New Orleans. She has been married to her husband, Kendrick, for 13 years, and they currently have two beautiful daughters, Carson, which is eight years old, and Kayla, which is also six years old. Please welcome Miss Christy Rapp. Thank you um, for that introduction. And uh, I am so happy to be here today. I am responsible for moderating the session this morning. And again, quite excited to hear what the panelists will share with us today about their experiences. So we're gonna get started right off with the introduction of the panelists. And first, we have Tanisha Craig-Stewart, MPA, 
and she is a native of Louisiana. She is a proud graduate of Louisiana State University, graduating with a Bachelor's of Arts in Communications. She also has earned her Master's of Public Administration at Southern University A&M College. Throughout her professional career, Stewart has worked diligently in the fields of secondary education and youth development in the greater Baton Rouge community and surrounding areas as a high school educator. Stewart is also the founder and lead health strategist of Extreme Life Fitness and Louisiana Fit Chicks organizations. She is also a contributing health and fitness correspondent for WAFB Channel 9 News, WBRZ Channel 2, and NBC 33 News in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In January 2019, she released her first book entitled Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, 10 Affirmations on Body Image. Stewart's main goal is to not only help individuals lose weight, but also empower them to become healthier people physically, mentally, and spiritually. I welcome to the panel, Tanisha Craig Stewart. Good morning. Thank you, ladies. Good morning. <clears throat> Our next panelist of the morning is Malika Favorite. Malika received her BFA and MFA in art from LSU Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Her artwork is featured in Art, African American by Samela Lewis. African American Art and Artists, also by Samela Lewis. Black Art in Louisiana by Barnadine B. Proctor and the St. James Guide to Black Artists by Thomas Riggs. Her works are in the following collection, Absolute Vodka, Morris Museum of Art, Augusta, Georgia, Alexandria Museum of Art, Alexandria, Louisiana, The Coca-Cola Company, Atlanta, Georgia, Hartsfield Jackson International Airport, Atlanta, Georgia, and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. She has two commissioned outdoor murals in Atlanta, Georgia, one on Auburn Avenue in 2007, and another on White Street in 2009. Malika is the 2018 recipient of the Michael Crespo Fellowship and a 2019 Puffin Foundation grant. Malika is also a poet. Her publications include Dreaming at the Manor, Finishing Line Press, 2014, in Illuminated Manuscript, published by New Orleans Poetry Journal Press, 1991, Malika won the 2015 Broadside Lotus Press Naomi Long Magic Poetry Award for her collection of poems, Ascension, in 2016. Please help me in welcoming the panelist and artist and writer, Ms. Malika, Malika Favorite. Our final panelist of the morning is Kiana Linnell. Growing up in small town, West Texas, Kiana grew her appreciation for all types of music and quickly realized music was a way to connect to the world. With a smile that will entrance you and a voice that helps your troubles disappear, Kiana's vocal dexterity allows her to perform a limitless repertoire. Infusing her classical training with her gospel upbringing, she approaches jazz as a storyteller. Graduating from Louisiana State University's music department, Kiana is able to harness her voice as a true instrument and perform various genres of music with precision and validity. Kiana frequents the stage as a clinician, performer, arranger, band leader, 
and songwriter. As she has made her way through the music scene, she has shared the stage with headline jazz artists such as Herlin Riley, Roderick Paulin, Don Bappy, Mitchell Player, and countless local artists and bands. Collaborating and creating lifelong experiences is a passion of Lin Linnell's. She has been a featured vocalist on various artist recordings. Kiana has performed with the Baton Rouge Symphony Orchestra as the principal soprano using the classical side of her voice and has performed at the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival presenting traditional jazz music. She has performed in several musicals throughout New Orleans and Baton Rouge, receiving rave reviews. Her love for music carries over into all interactions of her life. She spends most of her days curating new musicians as the music instructor at a primary school. She has also created a program which she shares in clinics nationally, nationally made in America, lyrically speaking, in which she delves into jazz, blues, and traditional American music from the vocalist perspective. When Lionel takes the stage, she guides the listeners on a journey where jazz collides with soul, allowing the simplest of melodies to entrance the listener. She creates an environment where love is paramount, emphasizing the importance of self-worth and respect through her music. She speaks uplifting lyrics to those who have been brokenhearted and stresses the importance of not letting the past dictate your future. Her new EP entitled Loving Me guides the listener through her own transformation. The transition to finding her self-worth has led Kiana on a journey that has also included health and fitness. As the creator of Musicians Run, she sponsors weekly meetups for musicians to meet and exercise promoting health as a wealth. She sees each opportunity to share music with any audience as a chance to create memories and build the soundtrack of life. Whether she is leading the band or supporting other artists, she is thankful to have the opportunity to sketch new memories that last a lifetime. Please help me in welcoming our final panelist of the morning, Miss Kiana Linnell. Good morning, everybody. And so again, I am very, very excited to speak with you this morning. Um, to the audience, we have a songstress, you know, we have a musician, we have a painter, we have a sculptor, a, a porch, um, um, one who writes poetry, and we also have a writer. And when I think of the arts, um, I think of expression of creativity through song, through words, through dance, through theater. And I must say a few years ago, I visited the National Museum of African-American Art in Washington, DC. And what I took from that, it was an experience, it was an emotional roller coaster, but everything was a visual display. It was a display through sound, through music, through photography, through paintings, through books, through words, and everything was art. It was the whole museum from the building, you know, from the actual building through that, from the basement all the way up through those floors. It was a visual, a visceral, a palpable experience. And it was all through the arts. And so how excited was I when, when I'm able to talk to people from Louisiana, you know, so I had that experience. And now I'm able to talk to, to artists that live in Louisiana, who were born in Louisiana, um, about their experiences. And so let's, let's kick this off with my very first question, okay? And this question will be directed to everyone. Uh, we can start with um, Miss Tanisha. I'm gonna start with you and then we'll move to uh, Malika and then uh, Kiana. 
how did you get where you are today? So from what I understand in reading your bio, you have recently published a book and we'll get more to, to the book in, in a few minutes. How did you get, what was your path to this book? Right. Well, first, thank you so much um, for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Spears, for thinking of me. Um, I definitely don't take it lightly to be able to pour into women. That is a passion of mine. So I am honored to share this conversation with you all beautiful ladies on this morning. But it didn't come easy. Um, you know, confidence and believing in yourself doesn't happen overnight. But just having different experiences and having women such as you all on the call to support my dreams, um, that was something that I grew up with. And as you can see, the first book is called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, 10 Affirmations on Body Image. So I was brought up with affirmations. I was told I was beautiful. I was smart. I was ambitious. And so when it comes to health and wellness, we need to have those same affirmations. We have to start speaking life into our bodies, life into our health, life into our family's health. So how the book came about, I am a fitness and wellness trainer, have been for about six, seven years, but I knew I couldn't touch every lady that I meet or encounter every lady as a client of mine. So I really wanted to write a book to really touch hundreds of women um, and men across the world. So I did write my book in 2019 and it's been a blessing. It's 10 affirmations and 10 prayers that go along with that book. But it started out with a thought. And I tell women all over, write it down, make it plain. Um, it's just that simple as far as taking a thought and put it into manifestation. So I never grew up meeting a Black author. I never knew what that looked like, not up close. I didn't have that opportunity. So this book, this first book was bigger than me. I wanted to have an opportunity for Black women to relate. Um, and also, like I said, I have male readers as well with this first book. So it's been a great journey. I'm still a newbie, but I finished my second book this past summer during the pandemic. And hopefully we can talk about that as well. Thank you so much. Um, I, I hear you starting out with the thought and, and we will yeah. come back to some of the things that you've said. So um, Malika, what brought to you to where you are today? Well, thank you again for having me as well. I appreciate the opportunity to share uh, where, I've, where I've been and how I've gotten here. I really started out, um, I've always loved art. You know, from first grade, uh, I was drawing, you know, and, and before I went to school, I was drawing and making pictures. It was just something I did for fun. I wasn't thinking of it as a career. I was just thinking of uh, just something to do. And, uh, when I was in college, I took my uh, took a lot of art classes, and I found that art was something <clears throat> that it was not work for me. It was pleasure. It was just fun. So I thought to myself, well, if if I want a, a career, I want to do something that I'm going to enjoy. And so I'm I always feel that I'm not working. I'm just enjoying and having a fun with the experience. And art for me has been that that thing that inspiration for a while you know it was it, it was difficult because black art does, does not sell as well as as art by white artists and women art by women did not sell as well as art by men so all of those things came into play and a lot of time it had to do with whether whether or not you could <clears throat> earn some money with you know creating art so I did do teaching and workshops and things like that to keep to keep me going. <coughs> Excuse me. But overall, it was the love of art and the pleasure I got from doing it and the pleasure I got from expressing myself in words that that kept me going. Thank you so much. And I hear the love of art. And I have a comment um, that I, I, I'm going to share after Kiana um, tells her, us briefly about her path, just regarding artists and, and my thoughts um, of, of artists in, in a moment. So Kiana, would you please share uh, with us your path to where you are now? 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much again for having me here. Um, my path has been ugly. It has been treacherous. It has been dangerous. And I just try to keep my head above the water. Um, my path to getting here has just been realizing that I'm worth every dream that I ever had as an eight-year-old. Um, music has always been my escape. You know, I, I can remember writing songs as young as like four. I would just sing to get through, you know, a, as a kid, I, I did not grow up in a, in, a, in a happy home, in a safe environment. And so music was always my way to get away from the realities of what was going on around me. And uh, as I look back now as an adult, and you know, through the healing that I've done, you know, you can only control your response and your reaction and your attitude on things. So music has always helped me say, all right, there may be a storm going on, but I'm gonna go in this corner and I'm gonna make up this song and it's gonna help me feel better to get through this situation. So as I um, grew into the woman and, and continue to grow as a woman, I realized that there's so many of us going through things that we can't talk about to everybody, we can't express to everyone, and the, the feelings that I have, I'm not alone, and, and they can help somebody else heal as well. And that's what really continues to push me on this journey and continues to drive me to create, make music, get up, smile, make a pretty face, you know, push through, because I'm not alone in this journey of self-love and discovery and, and, and realization and, and dreaming. Um, that's how I, I am here today. <laughs> it's from a dream. Well, um, for, thank you for sharing. And, you know, when I think about music or art and, and again, I, I relate my experiences because it was so profound, profound, the experience of me walking from that basement of that national museum, you know, and come and going up. Um, that art is, uh, it can be healing, you know, um, it, it displays emotion, um, art captures stories and history. Um, and uh, again, as I think about my experiences that hit me so pro profoundly, okay, you know, as I'm speaking with artists, um, I understand the importance and in, in my opinion, you know, the role that words, that art, that song have in our lives. And, and one thing I wanted to share before we move to the next question is, you know, I, I, I told you guys my definition of art, you know, it's an expression of creativity, but you know, artists are, and, and, and the president shared skill but oh my gosh, it has to be, in, in my opinion, this is my opinion, a God-given talent. Art, this is nothing that can be, to, in my opinion, taught. I can't sing and I'm using music. And, you know, I might can hold a tune, but, but Kiana, just hearing you, and I've heard you in the past, that's like a God-given, innate talent that you have that you're sharing with the world. Same thing with painting. <laughs> give me, you know, let me try to paint. I can try to mimic what I've seen, but those artists creativity and that's coming from a place that I have, you know, no words to describe God given talent. And that's all the books, you know, everyone can't write. And to, to see someone who has, you know, done that and made that first step, um, Tanisha, since you said, you know, it's, it's your first book, you know, and um, you have another one coming is just to me so astounding and, and so great and amazing what you all have achieved. And so now we, we've learned a little bit, you know, about the path. And one of the questions I, I was wondering about was, you know, when they were little, did they know? And I heard Malika say, you know, when she was first grade, she was drawing. And though she may not have known about it as a career, 
she she has passion she loves you know what she does and with Kiana I heard also when she's young she's been singing a long time and it's gotten her through some um challenges and some rough spots in in what she shared with us um and then with Tanisha what I hear I don't know if I heard maybe when you were first grade did you know you were going to write a book you know but what I gather from what you said is through your experiences um, and um, your, your fitness um, life and what you do there, you wanted to touch more people and therefore a book was birthed as you attempted to share, you know, your, um, what you would like to share with women. And so now I, I would like to sort of pivot just a little bit and I'm going to ask all the panel this question about when so you told us a little bit about the path to where you've got where where you came from to to get to where you are but when was that defining moment of i'm going to write that book or i'm going to step out and um, focus on painting or focus on becoming a musician can one of you begin with that? What was that defining moment for that decision to be made? I can, I can start. Okay. Um, like I said, growing up, I didn't, I wasn't exposed to Black authors. I had, I barely had Black teachers. Um, my dad was in the army, so I moved around a lot. So I would say my win for me was when I became an adult and I would walk into bookstores and I saw no one that looked like me. Um, even recently, because I wrote my book in 2019, so I'll say the win for me was probably around 2018, 2017. And I saw in the fitness and health section, no one that had a black face. And that is a problem. So you know, being a health and wellness um, educator, advocate, there aren't many, and someone said, as far as the painter world, it's kind of the same in the fitness world. There aren't many women, and if there are women, they're white women. So for me, it was on the sense of we need representation. And so I never grew up wanting to be an author. I, I That wasn't a dream, but I saw the need. And I was like, I have information to share. I have gems. I have jewels that I can pour out. And so it was really when I didn't see the representation that I know we have. And I know that we can serve many people like my other counterparts. And so I'll say about 2018, when I walked into a particular Barnes and Nobles and I was like, no, there's no one anywhere in this store that looks like me, um, a brown face, a brown woman that was displayed on the shelves. So that's really what made me take that motivation and, and publish my first book in 2019. Okay. Hey, I'll, um, I think for me, the defining moment was uh, in college, I was taking art classes and um, I enjoyed art and my understanding from my professors was that the only thing you can do with this with a degree in art was, was first of all, you had to go up continue and get an MFA because uh, most people I know who got just a BFA in art there was just no opening for black people uh, in the art field, especially in Louisiana. It was just nothing you could do with it other than you know, maybe teach art in, in public school. And so to go on and get your master's degree, MFA degree, master of fine arts degree, uh, that gave you the opportunity to teach in the university. And um, in teaching, I enjoyed teaching but I found that I, I was struggling between how much time do I give to teaching and what happens to my art career uh, if I'm going to be uh, totally dedicated to teaching. And that was always a, a battle for me, giving, you know, deciding how much to give to this, this and how much to give that. Because when I do something, I try to do my very best. And that means I, I sometimes overdo it. And so one thing gets... Uh, less attention than the other. And so that that was a struggle. But the, the thing that really got to me was that this is something I really want to do. And I mean, I was so serious about it that uh, when dating, I decided, well, I'm not going to marry a, a 
a painter or an artist because that means that I would have to compete with them. And usually the man takes over and say, well, you know, I'm going to be the artist and you can, you know, you know, you can do a little bit. And so, I mean, that, I consciously thought about that and that that was a conscious decision for me in deciding who to marry. So uh, I ended up married to, marrying someone who's a writer. That was a little safer. <laughs> but um, so over time, I, I just felt that I wanted this to be a serious part of my life. I didn't want it to be a a uh, something that I did on the side, a hobby. You know, and a lot of people think of art as a hobby and not as as a career choice. And so for me, I made that I want art to be a career choice and not a hobby. And the only way I could do that was to keep uh, trying and to keep at it seriously and to uh, make myself a part of the, the art world I was in, whatever city I was living in. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. It does. Oh, can you refresh the question for me? Yes, it's, 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 it's I like, what was that moment where, you know, you decided that you're going to make a go, you know, of being a musician full time? That was your, your livelihood. It's so many things to piggy, piggyback on. Mm -hmm. um, as a kid, you know, I, I grew up like looking at Whitney Houston. I'd be like, I want to be like Whitney. But then as you continue to grow, like when you look at these superstars and you only see that superstar level, it almost sometimes feels unattainable. And I went to school, studied voice. And again, to piggyback, there, there aren't a lot of the people that look like us, sound like us, are shaped like us, that are successful in, in the, at the level that we want to be in. And and you, be you begin to feel deterred, discouraged, and you start doing other things and your art becomes a supplement. If you, you I, I'll say you don't believe that you can, I didn't believe that I could live and support a family and, and fit into the, the roles of womanhood that I saw as a leading lady in art and as an artist. And then I realized that uh, you know, I was worth it. And if, if I needed to shift my environment or shift the people who were around me to realize that dream and goal that I had, that's what I needed to do. Cause I, I had to fulfill that. And uh, what the turning point for me was when I started hanging around artists who were making a livelihood for themselves and surviving and thriving, not on a Whitney Houston level, but on a regional level, a local level, a, a statewide level. And I was like, oh, this is something that can be attained and I can still feel fulfilled and create and have people and, 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 and create experiences with people. And it doesn't have to be Grammy award winning artists. I could be singing at eight weddings a year and have that moment, you know, have those experiences. And so it just started at, at creating the world I wanted in my current space. And I'll never forget like meeting musicians who toured during the summer, who were teachers, who supported their families as a, as a teaching artist. And they, they may have only toured on the weekends or only performed on the weekends. And it was like, oh, this is the way that you transition into, I had to get around people who were creating and living and modeling, modeling to me how to be an artist in the world successfully without having to be super famous. And that there are steps to getting to that level. Like I didn't have the model of an artist or a singer or a songwriter who was thriving and surviving. You know, you only see struggling people sometimes. It's like, well, I don't want to struggle. I don't want to be like not eating or I, I have children to feed, you know, I have a family to support. So how do we create this environment? How do I get into this industry and, and create a, a living for myself that is substantial and, and comfortable? You have to get around people who are doing that. So what the shift for me was about um, 2009, I started really getting around musicians who were thriving and world famous, but nobody may, local people may not have known them, you know, like had traveled the world, been around. And I was like, oh, let's go. 
<laughs> and I remember my grandmother used to tell me, so I, I, I transitioned into teaching and then I was able to perform more as a teacher. And that, that was one of the things that I saw a lot of artists doing. They taught music or band directors and then they also toured. And uh, my grandmother used to always tell me that I was a teacher. She would be like, I don't know why you're trying to act like you're not a teacher, but I, I, I fought it to the end. And then when I transitioned to be an artist, I was like, oh, that, that's what she saw in me is that mm -hmm. I'm a teaching artist. Like, yes, I should be teaching. I love children. I love helping people discover things. And so teaching has gone hand in hand with my, my touring for, mm -hmm. for as long as I've been doing it. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting that I think almost all three of you stated there's not many people, you know, that look like you, at, you know, when you're making these decisions. And, and um, I, I heard Tanisha share, you know, she's in that health and fitness section and there's no representation there. And Malika, I hear you when you're coming up there, you know, Black artist. And Kiana, I hear you the same. There's no one around um, that can mentor or, you know, help you with those things. How do you market yourself? So now I'm back, you know, um, with um, your, your book or your art or your poems or your song or your CD. You know, how do you market yourself when, I guess, to a broader audience? So not only to people who look like you, right, and and um, but to a broader audience, um, without, you know, losing why you're there in the first place. So Tanisha, the, I, I say that because, um, I remember you said, you know, you're looking for representation, right? Mm -hmm. And you certainly, um, I, I would hope that I could support and buy that book, but how do you even expand out for not only marketing to me, but you know a wider audience as well so that that question is for everyone and I'd love to hear your your thoughts about it okay um for me like I said just being an author for about two three almost three years I'm new to this I will share a moment where I thought I needed someone to open the door for me I always had that I had that mentality a few times but in this new lane that I'm in, I created my own door um, in the fact that I was a new author. I thought I, I reached out to someone in Atlanta, right? And she quoted me this price. And I said, well, I can make my own door and house and window for this price. And that's what I've done. Um, since I became an author in 2019, I created Black Authors Matter. And that is something that brings other authors locally throughout the state of Louisiana under one roof that I created because I didn't see it. Um, so it's been a blessing. I've probably had about six networking events. My next one is in Shreveport, Louisiana. So when you talk about expansion, I definitely think on the local level, like Kiana said, let me touch these people in Louisiana. Let me touch Mississippi, Texas, drivable places. So I've kind of been grassroots my first two years as an author, and it's been great making connections. Impact is really what I'm big on. And so if I can impact the city of New Orleans, like I said, I'm going to Shreveport next month. If I can impact, that is my goal. But of course, I'm on Amazon. I'm in, you know, international websites and platforms. But for me, where I am now, I want to impact people locally because a lot of people look at these doors that they think that are just going to direct them to success when at the end of the day, you can create your own door, your own stage, your own platform with that money you were going to invest in someone else to just give you a consultation for 30 minutes. So I had to wake up real quick because this is new for me. And I, when people meet me, I'm saying I'm, I'm 2019 in, you know, but a lot of people think I've written all these books, but I've always had a um, business type mind frame. So if I'm going to spend that $500, I'm going to create my event, my marketing, how I want it and bless some other people because I am a firm believer all these seeds that I'm sowing are going to come back to me 10 times fold. So it's, it's opening your own door and not waiting on someone to be that door for you. Excellent. Excellent. Jump in. I'm going to jump in and piggyback because, oh, you just said so much. 
the moments when I when I was making these transitions and you you sometimes you ask other people, hey, you want to come do this with me? And they'll be like, man, don't nobody do that. Don't nobody. And, and I want to say, I want to retract too. It's not that there aren't people or women that look like us doing it. It's just that we aren't shown them daily. They're not forced into our media. They're not forced into our feed, into our stream. Mm -hmm. We're hidden. You know, the algorithm is not pushing us the people who we want to see that look like us. And I feel like right now in the country, in our, in our culture, like this right here, these are places that we are pushing each other every day tirelessly. We're like, oh no, 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 look, look who I just found. And we're sharing each other all the time. I love to see other artists and other contemporaries like sharing people that are inspiring them that we may not know about. That's one of the strongest things that I feel that is available to us. It looked like social media, Mm -hmm. today is that I can share an artist that I know of that is just like me ground roots you know independent emerging and then people are like oh my god who is that like we have that power nowadays to impact and share each other and create our own uh like my Instagram is like a magazine you don't have to think of your 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 social media presence as a magazine of your life like who am I being influenced by what what is going on in my life how can I share some of the positivity that I see daily but going back to that creating your space you know in in any field women black women we are pushing against so many ceilings, so many barriers. And a lot of times we go to people to help us or we go to people to, to, to the, like I used to think I would have to be put on by somebody else that's already. And I just realized I have to create my own. I can't go to somebody else's band and try to give my, like what I want for my career. They're not gonna see me like that. I had to create my own band, create my own experiences, book my own gigs, even if they weren't where I wanted to be in the beginning people are going to then see me for me instead of me trying to fit into somebody else's environment and box. So that scary point of saying, no, let me just forge my idea, my itinerary, my, my agenda on my own mm -hmm. and invest that money in myself. Yeah. That, that definitely is a point. Mm -hmm. um, Ma Ma Malika, do you have anything to add with? Yes. With uh for me, it, it was more of uh, their strength in numbers. And I found that uh, as an artist, I, I wasn't making progress all by myself. I had to uh, join myself with other people who were creating. So uh, we formed a little group called Black Artists Network and we would uh, do workshops, do art shows together. And that gave us an opportunity to be recognized as people who, artists who are creating. Because if you're creating in uh, in the art world, if you're creating in a vacuum, nobody knows that you're doing anything other than mommy, mama, sister, brother, and and the neighbor cousin down the street. Nobody else knows. So this uh, was my realization that I had to uh, join myself with other other people. And then I realized that well, Black Artist Network was not enough. I needed to join myself with White Artist Network or whatever. So I joined uh, Women's Women Caucus for Art, uh, which was a local chapter of Women's Caucus for Art here in, in uh, Baton Rouge, and I was a member of that. And whenever an art event was going on, I made it a point to attend, go to other people's openings, uh, learn about other people's art. So it was a matter of making yourself seen and known in the art world. And that gave me the opportunity to be taken seriously as an, as an artist. Uh, earlier on, when I was fresh out of uh, college, I, I taught at Grambling State University for a, a, a few years, but I found that the, the art scene there was pretty dead. And so I really didn't want to stay in that environment. And when I moved back to Baton Rouge, I decided, well, I really want to be a part of the art culture here. And so rather than just waiting for something to happen, I started attending events at the Baton Rouge Gallery because that was, the, to me, the biggest gallery in the area. And then I got to know the, the, the director of the gallery. And when she was unable to 
be be there to sit with the gallery. I would sit at the gallery, anything to get myself known as an artist. And mm -hmm. gradually I became more and more recognized as a person who, who was serious about creating art. And that was the process I had to use to get to, to where I am. I couldn't just sit and wait for something to come to me. I had to go out there and, and find it and seek it and constantly push against the closed doors until they open up for me. And that's one thing I think I hear consistently with, with, with all of our, our um, panelists today. Um, you know, she said she couldn't wait. And I've heard um, someone say, you're creating your own door um, and or window, you know, wh whatever that is. And so I think you all have been consistent with, you know, what it takes to, to, to push forward. Um, um, with with your uh, with your art, and we do have an audience question question from the audience. So I'm going to go ahead and pose this particular question um, for those who have books or um, uh, poetry, uh, and even the, to the musician, it's it's about audio books. So um, I'll ask um, Tanisha first, and then Malika. Malika. Tanisha, is your book? Um, fearfully and wonderfully made. I think it was 10, 10 affirmations on body image. Is it available via audiobooks? Yes, on, on Kindle. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the follow up question is what was your lessons learned with that particular project going from print to audio? Right. Um, well, it, it is different, but it is, it is where we are now with technology. A lot of people like to read on the go. So, but you can have someone as a service if you don't want to do it yourself, but mm -hmm. I recommend reading your own book, but some people who might not feel as comfortable, they do have that service for you as well. So it wasn't, it wasn't bad for me because it's your words. So um, it's a different experience, but in our day and age with technology, people want something on the go and that they can listen to over and over again. So I'm a big fan of auto books as well. Okay, and Mal uh, Malika, are, is your poetry available as an audio book or is it in print only? It's only, it's only in print right now. Okay, only in print. And um, Kiana, I mean, as a musician, are, are, are your, um, is your music available, you know, um, on a platform easily accessible? It's everywhere, baby. It's everywhere. Yeah. Share with us. Share with us. iTunes, Amazon. Kim okay, I, I got you. And we're going to come it's back to it's everywhere. It's everywhere. <laughs> specific ones because now I want to move to before we get to some some advice you may have to some up and coming or artists. So there may be some attendees who who would like your advice on how you know how to move forward and what would you what feedback would you give them at this time. I really want to get to just in some questions I have just about your individual work. Since we have the artists here, I just wanted to ask you all have um, several things I could ask you about, but I'll start with um, Kiana, I'll start with you. And I attended an event a couple of weeks ago and you sang, you shared a song with us it was, um, I, I don't know if the name of it was March On, but I know you were saying we need to march on. So can you tell me a little bit about that song, you know, the inspiration for it and what inspired it? Yeah, so the song is called Sing Out March On. It's a okay. uh, part of a, a suite on my CD that goes from, um, no, actually it's not, let me, let me go back. So. Mm -hmm. I released this CD in 2019 and my CD is uh, uh, A Little Love. And leading up to the CD, every time I go on stage, it's it's really heavy on me to, to support and impact people in a way that makes them wanna go do something, right? Do something. Um, I feel like when I have the microphone it's my responsibility to inspire some type of change because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here if I wouldn't have decided a change was needed in my life. So that's my goal is to just inspire change, inspire something loving in somebody that's listening to me. So for the, the last, now it's been like six or seven years, ever since Trayvon, I have a, 
I have a, a time in my show where I am specifically speaking to people who need to change the way they think about people who are brown. And I have done songs, I create these suites, I create this prayerful moment for my country, for the people around me. And so fast forward to creating a CD, and I also have these gospel roots, you know, and that's what I love about being a jazz artist is I could sing whatever I want. I don't have to be stuck into R&B or soul or swing, you know, I can take any type of song and style it and create it and make it fit a moment and express a feeling that I have and that I'm that I'm currently going through. So you may come to my show on Monday and get one Kiana. You come on Friday and be like, oh, what is, who is this? So, but every show I'm going to speak to the current situations that are happening. Um, so I get to the CD and I, I am needing this gospel feeling. I needed this moment of like church. And so I went to my, my friend and mentor, Terrence Blanchard, and I was like, man, I just feel like I'm missing this part of my CD that is home. You know, I, I come from a, a church background. My family, every time we have a family reunion or a holiday, there's some singing going on. And so he was like, man, I need you to check out this YouTube clip. And so he sends me this clip of uh, Joshua Campbell singing at Harvard's, he has a group that is singing at Harvard's commencement. And uh, they have John Lewis is the speaker at their commencement, at the Harvard commencement. So John Lewis, Representative John Lewis, I'm sorry, may he mm -hmm. rest in peace. And the video is phenomenal. And it's this acapella group and they're singing, sing out, march on. So Joshua Campbell wrote this song to honor John Lewis, who was speaking at their commencement. Mm -hmm. And it just spoke to everything that I was feeling at the moment about how we need to continue to speak up, continue to march on, continue to make our voices heard, continue to press forward on the issues. And, and currently, like I'm working on, like I, I go to marches, I go try to be a part of the movement in the ways that I can. And to me, there's like this missing piece, you know, Back in the 60s, Nina and, and Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Like there was music that was a part of the movement. People went to the marches and were able to commune in song. And while you were walking and, and talking and relating to people, you were singing. And, and I feel like that's missing. So I wanted to be able to create something that could be a part of a movement, could be a part of spurring change for people. And at that event, you know, it was about change. It's about bringing people together. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm just happy to create something that can be, and so it's not my song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the okay. jazz artist, we a lot of times take songs from other people and re reimagine them, story mm -hmm. tell through them. And so Joshua Campbell, who's a current contemporary artist, he's a songwriter. He also wrote a song mm -hmm. for uh, Cynthia Erivo on Harriet. Um, I actually got to sing it with him at Carnegie Hall in December of 2019. I feel like 2020 is just a year that's like, what happened in 2020? <laughs> so so um, yeah, that song is very special to me. On my CD, my fan, I was actually able to go home and my whole family recorded the background vocals with me. So if oh. you listen to the song on my CD, it's my grandmother, my mom, my baby nieces, my dad, my great uncle. Like we, I, I sent out a text and I was like, hey, everybody meet me at granny's house. I'm recording my first international release CD and I would love to have y'all on my record. And they came out and we recorded the background vocals. So it's really special to me to have that song as a part of my history and my legacy uh, because it's really how mm -hmm. I grew up. Yeah, it speaks mm -hmm. to who I am totally as a person. Yeah, and and one of you know one of the questions, and I think you've sort of infused this in your response, was you know just about does your art comment on things that are happening, you know, in in the world? And I think you have sort of commented on that. Um, next, let me I'll, I'll sort of move to um, it, it does. I guess I'll go to Tanisha next. And and when I saw the title of your book, okay, fearfully and wonderfully made 10 affirmations on body image psalm 139 verse 14 i will praise thee right for i am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are thy works and thy and that my soul knoweth 
um, right well. And, and so it, it spoke to me just via the title. So can you, you say more about, um, you know, your inspiration? I, I know that you spoke about not having representation um, there uh, when you went through Barnes and Nobles. Can you say more? I'm, I'm looking at the book title and these 10 affirmations about what inspired, you know, this, this form, because you could have, I, I think, taken several paths to get mm -hmm. Um, this health and fitness book published, you know, and, and, but your, your title even speaks to me. So can you just talk more about that inspiration um, for, for your book? And, and, and if you're able to share, what is your, your title for book two? <laughs> well, like I said, um, just being in the health and wellness industry, I meet women all the time and it's, it's no secret. I am a Christian. I am a woman of faith. So I wanted my first book to be personal. I wanted it to captivate. Even if you aren't a believer, these are principles that you can live by. Like you said, fearfully and wonderfully made. We take care of things that we know the value of. So there's a lot of people who don't value their bodies because they don't know how important they are, how special they are. So not only do I give the 10 affirmations, but I have scripture to back every every affirmation so um and a prayer so this book is really to dive deeper in a woman or man's mind and saying I am unique I am special there's no one like me in the world um and then honoring your body loving your body understanding that you have purpose in your body um a lot of people don't value it because they don't know what they carry I talk about that in the book. You're carrying purpose. You're a purpose carrier. So um, this book was definitely personal to me. And even my readers, young and old, white and black, I've met a lot of readers that have written me back and said, wow, I never knew I was that special. I never knew that I mattered, that my body mattered, my health matters. And so um, that was really the inspiration for me. Of course, we can lose weight, we can get into that size, whatever. But if you do not understand your body and the purpose behind your health, then my job isn't done. So the first book was really just captivating the mind. And like we, I said earlier, speaking life into your body, speaking life into your health and your family's health. I tell people, if you did not come from a healthy family, make sure a healthy family comes from you. You have the opportunity to be the change agent. I don't want to hear, well, grandma used to make this and mama used to make this. Guess what? You have the opportunity to change the narrative. So um, the first book was uh, has been a blessing. Um, the second book, I did finish that in June 2020, and that is 10 Principles on a Happier, Healthier You. Stop dieting, start living. This is a lifestyle. Um, this is not a one, two, three fix. This is not a microwave situation. Of course, we want everything instant, but I talk about principles such as one, loving yourself. Another one, leaving toxic people in situations alone. Um, another principle, getting rest. So that second book is more practical um, lifestyle changes because it is a lifestyle. So I've, I've been honored to finish two books in the past two years. Okay, thank you so much. And before I ask, we do have another question coming from the audience, but I do want to turn to... Um, Malika, and you know, I'm asking about specific, I'm, I'm being very specific with the questions I asked, but I ran across, guys, this, um, this poem called Dream Garment, and I was so, you know, I read it, and then, and I, and, and Malika, I don't even know if I read the whole thing or was this an excerpt, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I read it and I was like, she's going to have to share. And, and it starts and, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But she said, I tried on the dream again. It does not fit. Mom says, I will grow into it. It sags at around the waist. The shoulders droop over my small arms like a too big coat on an orphan. Dreams can't come true until they fit she explained. And, and so I'll stop there because I was like, 
oh my goodness, look at this. And so I'm going to pause because I'm getting excited just by reading those first few lines about what that, what, that talk about that poem and, and what inspired you to, to, to write that. And it's called Dream okay, Garment. Okay, uh, Garment, right. You know, I, I have a series of paintings where I use garments, clothing in, in the paintings. I collage clothing like shirts and dresses and so forth into the painting. And um, I thought, well, you know, and, and in many of my poems, I write about clothing because it's like a, an important part of us, of, of who we are and what we, what we do. And I thought about the, the dreams that people have, all, you know, whenever you talk to little kids, you say, what are you going to be? And they, oh, I'm going to be this. Oh, I'm going to be a doctor. Oh, I'm going to be a, a football player, whatever. They all have a dream. But um, then over time, that dream kind of, you know, disappears. And, 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 and you talk to them later. I'm working at that, uh, the plant. I'm working at McDonald's, you know, but the dream is kind of faded in the background. And so I wanted to portray the idea that a dream, you don't give up on a dream. You got to think of it as something that, that you, you, you're constantly trying that dream on, make it fit, you know, oh, I'm, I'm closer to it, but it doesn't quite, isn't quite there yet, but I'm not giving up on the dream. I'm going to fit into the dream so that me and the dream become, become one people. <laughs> And so that, that's kind of what I was looking at when I, when I wrote the poem, that, that the dream, you become the dream. At first, it's a, it's a thing that's apart from you, but the more you wear it, the more you believe in it, all of a sudden, you are the dream. So that, that was my, my concept there. Yes, yes. And, and, and it ends, you know, keep imagining, because one day you won't have to try it on. It will be cozy on your person. I just, again, I, I, love, I it. love it. Now, now we all, we have another comment from the audience asking, where can they get a copy of that poem? Can you, can you share with what book that, you know, where is that published? Okay, this is a Ascension. This is my reading copy, but this is available. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. If you can't find it on Amazon, you can get it at Wayne State University Press. Um, you can just Google my name, Malika Favorite. And uh, it's and uh, on Amazon it should come up, mm -hmm. and it's in in Ascension, my last poetry book. Yes, and and maybe if there's time at the end, maybe we could get you know you to share a couple lines with us instead of me trying to to, to sure. the poem. I would be honored to hear your you know your interpretation as you speak on that point. Okay. Um. So, um. We had a question, another question from the audience, and this is directed to Malika and Kiana about what was your favorite moment, um, maybe internationally, if you had that opportunity when showcasing your work? Well, for me, uh, I think one of my favorite moments was I, I had the opportunity to do uh, some artwork in Atlanta. My time in Atlanta was really surreal because Atlanta was, is, it was like a, a, a center for Southern art. And uh, there was a, a respect for black artists in, in Atlanta. And that, that really, really moved me. So I was able to get a lot of art done there. And uh, I was, I created a, a mural for um, this, there were, there were, the uh, theater was doing a, the play, a play about, um, a, a f based on a, a, another, they were doing a play based on a, a famous work and they wanted a, a mural to go with that play to, to commemorate it. And uh, the women of Brewster Place, <laughs> to think about that one. Uh, so anyway, I did this mural on Auburn Street and uh, it was a large, large spa space. I had to climb a scaffolding to get to the top of it to draw it. And I'm the kind of artist like I can't draw something on, on paper and then shoot, a, shoot it on the, uh, on the wall and paint, paint by number. I don't do that. I have to do it free, free handed. 
And so for me, it was an amazing experience to, to have a, a canvas that large. It was a huge two-story building. And um, I, and, you know, it, 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 it was scary, but it, it, it grew me. You know, I learned from that experience. I learned a great deal from that experience. And uh, so when you have a challenge, that was a challenge for me to do that, but I'm so glad I did because that, that when you have something difficult, that's when you learn the most. Okay, and Kiana, any, um, any favorite experience you want to share? Those words, when you have something difficult, that's when you learn the most. Those words. I, um, I went on my first uh, solo international tour February of 2020, right? I, I had just, I released my record in 2019. I'm, I'm on another level. I'm, I'm an emerging artist is what they call me now. And so this is my first, I, I'm newly in the international realm. I was local, regional, and now I'm big time, quote unquote. But I'm back, it's like I'm back at the bottom, right? So um, I, my booking team, my management team, they got me on this international, this European tour um, last February, right before Corona. And as an independently sponsored artist, you know, there are financial difficulties, there are like structural difficulties, not having the team, this dream team that would take care of everything, but having, working with what you got. So I'm on the road for six weeks right? I'm a, I'm a single mom. Um, I have two children that are home and I have a team of people everywhere, you know? And so leaving and going on tour and like, I, I got my first business credit card, like right before I went <laughs> and I was nerd, like financially, I'm like, I'm the boss. Like I have these grown men in my control. I have to be mom halfway wife halfway boss hat like I'm counselor there's so many hats you wear when you're the boss and as a woman you know we we wear all those hats we take them off flip them on I'm the cook I'm I'm the the travel agent I'm I'm in charge of everything and still parenting and and teaching I have students you know it's just a lot of moving parts and I say all that to say that there were some extreme challenges going home, going on at home while I was on the road. And also the challenges of being a new artist and worried about, you know, this is my first European tour. There are people coming to review my show. You know, this is my first step as an international touring jazz artist. And they're, they're, these writers are out there waiting on you to mess up. <laughs> And so this pressure of like, okay, be on your stuff and, and get it together and, and call your kids and, and then have to compartmentalize that and get on stage and, and give these people a show that they've been waiting on. They've been waiting on you to come here and help them feel something or release or relate or are you the next thing, you know? And so those pressures are unsurmountable sometimes. But I say that to say, there was this night in Amsterdam. So we I, I had we spent a week in Switzerland at Marion's Jazz Room. And I had my band, I couldn't afford to bring my band from the United States. So I brought one player from the US and then I had hired people that were in Europe. And so we spent a week in Switzerland getting our, our jam tight. Some things happened at home. And then we leave from Switzerland and we're flying to Amsterdam. The flight, was the worst flight I've ever had in my life. The, 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 what's it called? The um, turbulence. We were sitting in the plane like, Jesus, are we coming? Like we were literally praying in the plane because it was horrible. The wind was horrible. We get to Amsterdam, we get off the plane and the wind is still like whipping us as we're walking to the hotel. We get to the hotel. They don't have our reservations. We have to sit in the lobby for like four hours. We have to go do sound check. It's ridiculous. I get to the venue. My voice is like, <laughs> it's spotty. I'm not hitting notes that I want to hit. And I'm like, wow, okay. How, what is really about to happen tonight? 
Then we have dinner and the food is like marvelous and it's almost all vegan. So to be like American and like some meat and then you get this vegan meal that's like, who cooked this? It was just magical, right? The show happens, it's phenomenal. It's like the best show I've had in years. It was, it was magical. So it's at Ben House in Amsterdam. The stage is overlooking this water. The theater is beautiful. The lighting, the sound technicians, everybody was so like waiting to help us be great. And for that to happen in the midst of almost dying, on, like feeling like I'm almost gonna die on a plane. I had just had like these really I mean, I'm gonna share this later in my book. I'm, I'm working on a book too. <laughs> so so the, the, the situation that I had at home and then to be able to go out and create this piece of art that I'm actually gonna release, they recorded this show and to go back. So fast forward, then we come home, COVID happens. And this is the last recording of a live show that I have. And to go back and listen to it and to be able to have that to listen to as I haven't performed in 10 months, you know, but, and I, and I say this all the time, if I never sing again, that show is like the epitome of all the work I've done. I believe I'm a firm believer in reflecting. Like you have to set these goals, but then you have to reflect. You have to look back at, like we get so caught up in where we want to be sometimes that we don't take a look at where we are and how far we've come. So to be able to look back and reflect and listen to that piece of that night of music, I'm super proud of the person that I've grown to be even throughout the, like, this is why I smile. That's why I'm on this thing. I'm like, all right, I haven't sang in 12 months, but guess what? I got this piece of music that's going to be like, woo, Keanu was doing it. And that was a year ago. So yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. that's what yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing. And as uh, as we are we are watching the time, and as we sort of wrap up and to to give it back um, um, for um, the thanks by the president, I, I just want to to make sure I sort of summarize what I've heard today. Um, what, what Kiana, we did have a question from the audience. Do you play any instruments? So I, I, I play piano some, I, it's one of my things I'm going to try to do more in the future is play in front of people. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I focus, my instrument is my voice. That's what it is. That's what all my, most of my attention goes on vocally being able to captivate every idea that comes out of my brain. So I do play, I, I, I was a band director. Trumpet is my instrument in band, but I'm a, I am play piano. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. And so I hear I, 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 I've heard, you know, how the path to where you are today, some of the challenges opening that door and, and having this revelation of what needs to be done, you know, for you to take that next step in what um, your craft is, right? What, what, your, um, what your practice is. And, and, and finally, I would ask in, in 20 seconds or less, this is the final question coming for the panel, 20 seconds now, 20 seconds or less, what is your advice to someone attending who may be interested in, you know, writing a book or an aspiring musician or a painter, if you could give, you know, some advice in 20 seconds or less, and we'll start with um, Ms. Tanisha, 20 seconds or less. Okay, so I would say I love that poem that you just recited. Um, you're not too young, you're not too old to dream. Never stop dreaming. Also, everyone has a story and there's someone attached to your story. So go ahead and write that book. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Malika? I would say the important thing is to know that you can do it and don't say I can't draw a straight line. I hate when people say that because that that does not apply. If you want to make colors on paper, that is just as valid as straight lines or, or realistic pictures of people or objects. So I would say just go for it, do it, and don't stop doing it. The, the thing that uh, bothers me is when people who are very talented get so far and then they say, oh, I, I just can't go on. And they stop be, and, and all that talent is wasted. So, I, so you just keep going, you keep trying from one thing to the next and don't give up. Thank you. And finally, Kiana, 20 seconds or less, please. 
right, so I would say dreams are only realized if you make a plan. So you have to make a plan, work the plan, and keep going. Just keep going. Don't compare yourself. Don't think about where you're not. Think about where you're going. Work the plan. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I believe at this time, um, so our spheres, uh, I don't know, do I turn it back over to whomever is, is next with? Oh, we have two. Um, um, moderator, you will um, pose two questions to the audience member. Okay. And um, there you go. Okay. The first question. Does Miss Lionel Linnell play any instruments? And I'm assuming they're answering in the chat. So we we have a yes. Do which one? Okay, we have a trumpet and piano. Little piano. Okay. Okay. I have the answer. I um. Let's see, let's see. The answer is correctly answered. I'm from Carissa Reed. However, she is a chapter member, sorry. <laughs> so Erica Stewart, Erica Stewart, Little Piano was the second person, not a chapter member that answered correctly. Okay. Next question. You ready? How many commissioned outdoor murals? Yes, yeah, so the next question. How many commissioned outdoor murals does Miss Averett currently have? Do you all remember? It was read in the bio. Yes. I'll give you five more seconds. Okay, the poll is closed. I did not have an answer. Thank you all for joining. I'll turn it over to our Madam President for our thank yous. The answer was two. Wow, this has just been outstanding. As I said, and I listened to your testimonies, I was just overwhelmed. It was just really, really great. And uh, from your perspective, I don't know how, whether you know how powerful the things that you have said this morning, but it reaches and touches, I hope, the hearts and minds of everybody participating on this call. Uh, I, I just want to thank you. I want to commend and congratulate you for the contributions you have made this morning, but also for the contributions you've made to your communities and around the world. This, this is, was so powerful because art 
is in everything. Everything we do, there is art. And so as I listened to you tell your stories, I was just, I was just amazed. And I, I don't know whether you told your story this way, but I heard it in a, a three-step process when you were talking about the path that you use or that you uh, follow as you got to the point where you are now. The first thing I heard was that you had to make a decision. You had to come to some point in your life where you were going to pursue this thing that was just with you for such a long time. And then secondly, once you made that decision, you had to balance that out. You know, uh, do I follow this as a career, as, as art in itself, or do I uh, follow it in, on a permanent basis in terms of just enjoying what I do? And then finally, you had to find a way to, how am I gonna impact the world? How am I going to impact the people around me in my communities? with this skill that I have. But when we think of art, this and this is one thing we know that in our schools today, we use the arts to try to help children to build and construct understanding in other areas. You know, whether it's music, whether it's visual art or drama, we use it every day. And as I listen to you and, and uh, Kiana, uh, with uh, teaching and Malika with teaching, you use that uh, as a tool to embrace uh, what you're doing and, and to impact other children and other people throughout the world. And so uh, each of you, as you talked about your passion, uh, Kiana said that it was always a dream. And every day we go to school, we encourage children to dream you know, to dream big, to reach the impossible. And that is so critical. And uh, Malika, I really like what you said because I know in schools, children will engage themselves in art and music. And I had a little boy to come to me yesterday to show me a painting, a drawing that he had done. And he enjoys it, but not knowing where in the future this might take him. And the same thing with you. You did something that you loved, you had a passion for. And you didn't know as you got older in your life that this would be your life career. So that is so important. And Tanisha, just using your own personal experience to craft your art, you're just seeing around you that there weren't a whole lot of people that you were seeing in the space where you were and in your adult life, once you were older, you decided to pursue that. And that is just, just really so powerful. And I just believe that art is such a powerful tool. I mean, we use it to express our feelings, our attitudes, our thoughts, to just relieve our tensions or whatever it might be. But I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I thank you for taking the time out to do this. And I don't know if you know the messages and, and the statements you've made uh, today, I'm sure are gonna resonate in the minds and hearts of those who are here today for some time to come. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We wish you well. We know we can never pay you for what you've done, but a lot of uh, appreciation and heartfelt thanks for the job you've done this morning. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. We want to thank all the participants on the line today, because without you, this would not have been successful. You heard these stories, but we need people to hear these stories so that it could make an impact on their lives. Thank you once again, one and all, for being here. We want to thank our uh, chair, uh, Sora Spears, and Sora Rapp. And I, I know most of you don't know that she just jumped in at the last minute to do this. She wasn't originally supposed to do it, but just did an excellent job. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and have a great day. Our panelists, can everyone stay on for one quick second for me, please, as everyone else exits. Thank you.